Hello, and welcome to Code for Fun's Roblox Introduction class. My name is Brian, and I'll be your instructor today. A little bit about myself. Two years ago, I got my degree in computer science. I have been teaching with Code for Fun ever since. Um, I have taught subjects all as low as Scratch and even counting with B-Bots all the way up to web programming, Python programming, uh, Roblox, Minecraft, and more. So, you're interested in Roblox. Let's talk about what that is. Roblox is a gaming platform that allows its users to create video games and share them with their friends. Uh, there is an opportunity to make money if you actually do a good job and people use your stuff. So it's a valuable trade to learn and it's a very fun way to learn programming. So let's take a look at Roblox Studio. Now when you first launch Roblox Studio, you're going to come to this new screen. This is sort of like the home page. And it allows you to choose from different templates. Okay? They range from being extremely basic to a lot more complex. Okay? Now these are fun worlds to explore. However, we'll be making our own today. So I want you guys to please click on Flat Terrain. This is going to launch a new project using this template. And it's very simple. It's just a square plot of land with grass material on top of it, which is a perfect place for us to start. Before we get started on the activities, we need to talk about how to use Roblox. Okay. Now, just like games, you can use the W, A, S, and D keys to move your camera, okay? If you hold E, it will bring you up in relation to your camera. So hold E, hold Q to bring yourself back down. And when I say in relation to your camera, I mean it like this. If I look down and I hold E, it doesn't bring me up per se, it just brings me up to where I'm looking. Okay, so keep those in mind. On top of that, let's take a look at the view menu. Okay, here are all the menus that you can use. They have a variety of tools that um, allow us to do our job in Roblox Studios. However, one of the first things I want you to do is go to view. And please make sure that Explorer and Properties and Output are all selected. Right? I don't want your screen to look like this. I want it to look like this. And the reason why I have you put these here is because they're incredibly useful to our workflow later on. Okay, So it's good to just know that they're here. Um, just to describe what each one of these windows are, the Explorer contains all of the objects and all of the like files, all the things that you want to work with. Okay, Every time you add an object to this, uh, project, you're going to get another object over here in the Explorer. Okay. On top of that, we have the properties. Okay. The properties allows us to change different characteristics of each of these objects. And you can change them in real time by just typing in different values in this properties window. Okay. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Now this output is the final window. Output is information that comes from the user or from the computer and goes towards the user okay so we can send messages to our user to allow us to debug like to develop our code and fix it um, now our first step we're going to create a beautiful world and we are almost going to do none of that work it's going to be really sweet so if you go to home, you can click on this editor. And once you have that open, there's this generate button. Okay, this will generate a land for us. But if you scroll out, you'll see that it has this gigantic box around it. Okay, it's actually going to fill this entire world, this whole block or er, box with terrain. And here, you want to decide what kind of terrain. Well, I definitely want water. 
And hills and mountains, plains, that all sounds good to me. Um, we are going to deselect caves. Okay, we don't want caves in this, this sense, right? In this lesson. You can have as many caves as you want later. Um, and one more thing to note. There's something called this seed. Okay, a seed is a number that's given to this generator. And depending on whatever number this is, it's going to generate a brand new world. So what this means, though, is that let's say you generate the best world that you ever could imagine. If you want your friend to generate the same world, you give them this seed and you give them the same exact biomes that you applied. And Roblox should be able to recreate that world for you. OK, just a quick lesson. So let's go ahead and hit generate. OK, this is going to take some time. Um, it's a pretty laborsome process for your computer to build this world. Um, however, Roblox is pretty impressive. It does it fairly quickly. Um, so in, in a matter of seconds, you've generated a beautiful world. Look at this. It's great. But let's say I wanted it to be a little different. Maybe I'm not happy with how this looks. Well, let's generate a different number. Let's put, I don't know, 95 here instead of 88. And I click this and it goes and it does it again. This time, a little more random, a little different. So I look back and I'm okay with this world, okay? Please go ahead and generate a few worlds, okay? Remember what your numbers are. Only change the last like two digits. So you can go back. And let's say you, I generated this world, but I didn't like it. I want to go back. I could just go back to 88, and it should bring me back to the same world if I am correct. Yep, it looks uh, pretty much exactly the same as it did earlier. Okay, so the seed is working. Once you're happy with your generated world, we will continue. So please make sure that you're happy before you continue this video. Awesome. Okay. Now, with our world generated, what we want to do next is we are going to change some stuff about our world. Um, for example, let's say I wanted to change my terrain, uh, the watercolor. The way you want to do that is you go to terrain in the Explorer. And now you can go uh, down to the properties after you've selected terrain. And there's a watercolor property if you click on it, it allows you to drag and choose any color you would like. Now, normally water doesn't have that much brightness, but because we can do anything we want with Roblox, let's go ahead and turn up this little slider here and make this as like a, a vibrant color, right? This is some radioactive land, maybe. Um, whatever you would like. So I'll hit OK here. Go ahead change your color of your water, um, play around with different values, and then we'll continue. All right. To make things look even better, you can um, click this little decoration property. And when you enable this, it actually loads in grass blades. Okay, so it puts a little more detail on the land. The reason why this is deselected um, by default is, well, your computer has to load every single one of these little triangles and it has to move them with the wind, right? So this is actually your computer doing probably thousands and thousands of calculations every second. So if you find that this is too laggy for your computer, just deselect it, it's not a big deal. All right, now let's say that we are happy with our world and we want to play it. So there's a play button. Here I am in the home menu. Here's the play button, which has multiple options. Okay, play here will drop the character wherever your camera is. 
play is just your average drop the character in on the spawn point and continue from there. Run will execute everything, but it will not put a player in the world. Okay, so we're looking for player, or just play. Here we are. Now remember, uh, these are standard Roblox controls. W forward, S backward, A left, and D right. You can jump with spacebar, and to pan your camera, you have to hold the right click and pan or move your move your mouse. By the way, guys, I highly recommend using a mouse when you're doing Roblox programming. It makes your life a lot easier. Having a trackpad and right clicking and it's a mess. Um, just having the ability to right click on a mouse is a godsend in Roblox. Just something to consider. Okay, so we're happy with our world. Um, go ahead and explore it, right? You realize how big it is when you put your character in. Um, it is a very large world. So have fun, go explore it, get on the top of the mountains, you know, yell, whatever you want. Go for it. Okay. Now, generating the world is great, but fine tuning it to what you exactly want is even better. So the way that you can fine tune your world is by going to the edit tab in the terrain editor. Okay, the edit tab right here. And now we have a variety of tools that we can use to shape our world. The add um, will build on top of what's or, uh, already there, right? This geometry that's already there, it's on top of it. For example, I can just click and it builds. Now you may see this weird distracting white grid, okay? It's incredibly important. Um, what this tells you is if you click and drag, along what direction is this gonna, you know, go along with? So for example, you can see that this grid is like slightly tilted. So let's click and drag forward and you'll see that it does have an angle, right? It is angled. So if I wanna make, let's say a pillar that goes straight up, um, this grid changes its orientation or the direction that it faces depending on where your camera is looking. So if I look straight down, the grid becomes flat across the, the land. This is probably a good idea if you wanted to make like a maze or something. I could put a square block, right? Is the shape that I'm gonna add. And I just, you know, maybe here's the hedge and you know, it just cycles in on itself or something. And here's the plot of gold in the, in the middle of the maze, whatever. Um, this grid is incredibly useful. Okay. So I want you guys to spend at least five minutes playing with this grid and adding things in different directions. Okay, uh, This is very handy. So go ahead and do so now, please. Play around with the add tool for a couple minutes. All right. Now, maybe in your exploration, you notice that you can change the material that you're building with. So instead of grass, which is boring, let's do lava. So now I'm creating like pillars of lava just shooting from the ground, okay? Maybe, I mean, the water's pink, it's radioactive. Why, why wouldn't volcanoes be here? So materials are important. If you wanted to change the size, maybe you're making a very large plateau somewhere. Um, play around with these different sizes. Now we have subtract, and it does exactly the opposite. You would probably assume that, right? So it just takes big chunks out of the world, okay? I don't find myself using this tool very much, except, except when I wanna make a cave, perhaps. So let's say I want, right here, this looks like a good little cave entrance. I can just click through this a couple times, and that's simply, I made a cave all the way through it. Okay, it's pretty neat. So play around with subtract for just a minute or two. Um, I'm sure you get it, it's very basic. 
And now, I'm going to recommend that you use Grow and Erode. Um, these are the tools that look more natural. I use them way more than Add and Subtract. Uh, grow will basically just build on whatever you have, but it looks, it, it, it slowly grows. Okay, for example, right, right here. Maybe that's hard to see. Let's say I wanted to make a really big hill. I could do add, I could make a circle and make it really big and boom. But that doesn't look natural, right? In the world, you hardly ever find these perfect curves, right? It's a little bumpy, but you know, it's too close to perfect. Instead, you can grow. And you do want to have a large size of this, like that. And I'll undo that and grow in its place. So here we go. I'm going to click and hold because it does take some time for the grow to work like that. OK, this is actually a little too perfect again, but that is how grow works. So let, let's do let's make it a little bit slanted, comes off onto the edge right here. Boom. It looks more natural. Go ahead and play around with grow for a minute or two grow some hills, uh, expand, you know, maybe your water line or something, whatever you want. Now we're on to erode. Erode um, basically like disintegrates the land. It like melts the land. So here we go. As you click and hold, it's going to again melt this land. Super handy um, for maybe shaping things up, like adding some less than perfect details to your hills or whatever, right? Make it look a little more realistic, okay? So a road also can be used to create tunnels, right? If you just click and hold, it's gonna carve a path right through it, okay? It's a little harder to control than the subtract though. So keep that in mind, it's not gonna make these perfect caverns. So it just depends on what you want. Okay. Have fun with the road. Make some make some um, some caves for a sec, and I will briefly talk about smooth and flatten. Now these names are fairly self-explanatory, but smooth allows you to smooth edges. Maybe this is too sharp for you, and you want to kind of smooth it out. Well, that didn't work very well. So maybe I could erode this a little bit. Okay, so the water's trying its best to fill in. Um, that's not going very well. And we'll fix that in a little bit, don't worry. Um, flatten will bring multiple levels to wherever this grid is placed, okay? So let's say I wanna flatten this out a little bit. I wanna make sure I put the grid where I want it, everything to be. Then I click and drag everything around it to that level. This will bring things that are high, low to this level and things low, high, or like this. Okay. This has special use cases, but it is a useful tool. All right. Go ahead and experiment with the smooth and flatten. We'll see if you can get them to work. All right, the paint tool is a tool that we can use to change the look, but not the shape of our objects, okay? For example, um, let's say I want this big icy world or a big icy hill, okay? This is painting onto it. It's not changing the shape of this hill at all, just the look, okay? We're changing the material to be specific. Now, there is one exception to paint not changing the geometry, and that's water. When you paint water onto the world, it does kind of sink the ground a little bit, like here. Okay, You can see that it kind of took a chunk out and put water in its place. This is really useful for drawing like um, shallow rivers that go across your world, right? Not big lakes like this, but it's really good for maybe connecting them, right? So maybe the water somehow against gravity 
uh, makes its way to this other little this other little section, little little reservoir. Okay. Now, go ahead and paint some stuff. Paint some water. Uh, make sure you know how to do that. It's incredibly useful. Um, with that said, we have one more tool, and that is sea level. Remember when I said that I was going to fix this ugly problem over here? Well, now is the time. Sea level allows us to form this really, really, really big block, just like when we were generating the world. However, what you can do is bring this top bar down, this block orb, and you'll see that things are starting to peak out of this water level. Okay, so let's say through your experimenting, let's uh, really quick, through your experimentation, you created a whole bunch of these giant pillars. And now you have a very raised world. Well, you could flood this world and make those pillars kind of important for survival by using the sea level. And you can drag this to wherever you'd like and hit create. And now our world is flooded with radioactive water. So this is not healthy. Good thing it's a game. And, and that's sea level for you. Okay, let's say you didn't want it that big though. So you can actually bring this back down. And I believe you wanna hit, you wanna bring it back up, excuse me, hit evaporate, and then reestablish where you'd like the water to be. So when I said evaporate, that actually did take all of the water that I drew over here, and even the painted water is gone now. Okay, so, Keep that in mind. Let's flood this right here. This looks good to me. There we go. Go ahead and play around with your uh, sea level. All right, now it's time for us to start working with some parts. A model in Roblox is a 3D object that has properties. For example, here is a model that I'm going to spawn right now. In the home menu, there's a part tool. And it allows you to spawn any different shape, you know, of these four. And these are the basic building blocks that we can use to create our world, right? Um, with these objects, you can stretch and skew them however you'd like to build whatever's in your mind, right? These are the basic building blocks. For now, I'm just going to click on block. And you can see here that we now have this, this little brick. There we go. Okay. So um, let's talk about these tools up here in the home or model home and model both have these four tools select move scale and rotate let's start with move now it comes often time that you need to really finely place something and you know you're probably familiar with clicking and dragging things and that's cool but it doesn't really do the job so when you have really precise work you have to use the move. You have these different colored arrows. Okay, these are these correspond with X, Y, and Z. Um, this is a 3D world, after all. So you have to keep track of three axes. So Y being green, up and down. Blue being Z, which is like forward and backward. And X is the red one, which is left to right. Okay. Please experiment. Um, please practice using this move tool right now. Okay. Scale. Scale allows you to stretch your parts. Maybe I wanted this to be a lot longer. Maybe it's um, like a light post. So I'm gonna make it nice and thin. I'm gonna stretch it out and then rotate it using again, three axes 
and you want to grab um, you, well you have you're gonna have to play around with this but for me I need to grab the blue one and bring it up okay and that's just about straight up and down that's good with me okay so here's our little lamp post or whatever you don't have to make this this is just an just a an example of how to use these tools okay um, we're actually going to step away from the lamp post but I just wanted to show you an example okay now we have our part um, I am going to turn this part into a big block. Okay, I'm going to bring it down a little bit. And after selecting this block, I can start modifying its properties. So let's do brick color. Brick color allows you to change the color of the, the block to any of these preset colors, right? They have names. Um, let's do, I'll do really red. Okay. But if that didn't do it for you, you could also change the color instead. Um, this is a very, very much more precise way of changing and getting the exact colors that you would like. Um, but it is more complicated. It doesn't really make sense for this. So I'm just going to go with brick color, really red, easy peasy. Now, there are other things we can change, like the material, okay? Everything defaults to plastic, which is basically just like a uniform color. It doesn't have any appearance to it, um, and we're gonna change that. So, plastic, let's go ahead and do, um, I'm gonna do brick, right? Because I chose red. This kind of makes sense, right? But, maybe you want neon, or neon neon's fun it shines okay play around check out every different material right find one that you like you don't have to do brick you don't have to do neon go ahead spend some time okay welcome back now we have a part it's looking pretty let's do some stuff with it one of the first things you should always do when you are creating things, this is universal in computer science, give your parts names, okay? Because um, every time you spawn a part, it's called part. And if I spawn 50 parts, which one am I talking about? No one knows. So this one's going to be called hello part, okay? Hello part. Now, once you have hello part renamed, we're going to add a script to this object. And what this does is it kind of like assigns code to this block. And when the block loads into the world, when it's rendered, it's going to load the script as well. It's going to launch or execute the script. So let's write the script. Um, to do that, to add a script, you go to the Explorer, you find hello part, and you can hit this little plus sign and select script. Okay. Now each script comes with the default print hello world. Okay. As a programmer, um, you may have seen hello world before. This is like the universal statement that every new programmer makes. It is a classic and we will not, it's not lost on us. So what does print hello world do? Well, if you recall, I had you pull up this output window. And the output window is where we're gonna find that print statement, but it only runs again when this block loads into the world. So let's do that. Now, if I hit play, you may recall um, that I have a flooded world. And I'm doing all this experimentation on a platform that is, I will never be able to jump this high. So if you recall, I can do play, play here. 
and it'll drop my character right into the brick. And you can see Hello World right here. And it even tells you what script the, the print statement came from and what line of code, right? So this is the first line of code. Nice. Go ahead and run the script. Make sure that you see Hello World. Um, if you don't remember how to get to the output window, it's view and then select output. And what we're going to do next is we're going to start writing a script. And, and this script is going to activate when this brick is touched. Okay. Now, one of the first things you have to do is we're going to grab this brick. First off, I'm going to stop my run. Okay. Don't code when you have the game running. It doesn't always save your work, so be careful. Um, but the first thing that you want to do is you want to grab the hello part, and you want to do that in the code somehow. So you're basically saying, okay, I see this hello part in the world, and I'm going to go grab it so I can manipulate it in the code. It's very simple in this case local and we can call it hello part equals script dot parent okay script dot parent is weird um i'm only going to give you a quick explanation on this uh, we go with through it in more detail throughout the classes but it's something you have to see a couple times to fully understand um script is the child of hello part you can tell because when I collapse this, um, the script goes away. So this means that hello part kind of owns this script. This script is the child of hello part. And by relation, what that means is that hello part is the parent of our script. There is always a two way relationship parent to child in Roblox. So, um, just a little tidbit for you there. Now that we have hello part, we want to create a function, which is a group of instructions that performs an action. Um, we want to write a function that's going to print something if our brick is touched. So local function on touch. This can be called whatever you want. I could call this blah function if I wanted. But as a good programmer, we always describe what the function does. And this is on touch. Functions always require parentheses on the end um, and this little end keyword. Okay. So though you may have noticed that the end thing kind of popped up. When you get to this end of the line right here and you hit enter, Roblox will automatically add this end and tab in your cursor so you're ready to just start typing right after that okay super handy now first let's just print something like touched and you'll see that if you run it right now the on touch you'll never get this print statement and that is because we haven't connected this function to the brick part the hello part you have to connect them together for them to know when to uh, launch the on touch. Here's how you do it. Hello part dot touched. So it's saying, all right, whenever someone touches our hello part, do this. So we're connecting the on touch function. Okay, no parentheses here, just, just this normal one, right? On touch. These names are exactly the same. If you misspell them, it's not going to work. So be careful. Um, and let's go ahead and run it. I'll play from here again. And let's see what our, our output is. OK, you can tell that it's actually being touched as we speak, which is a little bit strange. But not really. Um, if you think about it, this block is placed on the ground so it is touching something and it's going to constantly check for that 
and it's going to constantly tell us that it's being touched. We don't want that. We want our brick to only say that it was touched if a human does that. Okay, only if it makes a contact with a human body. So here's how we do that. First off, the on touch event will will automatically pass in if you put a name here, like part hit. It's automatically going to pass in whatever object touched the brick. So for example, if I run into my brick, I'll just show you this. If I run into this part, um, yes, uh, you'll see that maybe my hand makes contact, right? So part hit will actually be my hand. If this was on the floor and I stepped on it, then part hit would be my foot. This takes on whatever object touches the brick. Okay? I can't emphasize that enough. It's kind of like some weird voodoo magic, but you just have to trust that when you put a name here, um, it's going to be whatever object hits the, the brick. Now using this, I'm gonna stop my run, using that part, I can trace up the foot or trace up the hand to the body. And I can check, are you a full humanoid? And if you are, only then I'm gonna print that we've been touched or whatever. So here's how you do that. We're gonna create a new variable called parent lowercase p and set it equal to part hit dot capital P parent. So this is me grabbing the chest from the hand or grabbing the chest from the foot, okay? It's kind of a weird way, but you trace up towards the center of the human. Now, with that said, let's grab the full human object. Local human equals parent, and then here, here we go. Colon, find first child which is a humanoid. You have to type this exactly like this, okay? All of these uh, uppercases, everything, this is which with, a, with an H, okay? We're not talking about which is, no, okay? Find first child which is a humanoid, okay? Which is like a, just a human, human object. Now, it's not gonna work yet. We have to check if the human actually exists, right? Because let's say that the floor was part hit, right? Which happens, right? When the game loads, the brick is touching the floor. So part hit is equal to the floor. We look for a human in the floor. And this right here is saying, if you found a human, okay? Only if you found a human, should we print this statement here? And now let's see what our print statements look like. <clears throat> okay, we don't see any touch yet. Okay, that's a good sign. The floor isn't activating this code. Let's take a look at if we touch it. Ah, look at that. Okay, it's working. Now you may have noticed that this number shot up to 148 within less than two seconds. And what that tells you is that, well, Roblox is, is firing off and executing at, you know, hundreds of times per second. So it's incredibly fast. I mean, this is true about all computers pretty much. It's just crazy fast. Um, so you do have to keep that in, in mind. Uh, sometimes you have to purposely slow down your program so that it doesn't have a, a thousand executions uh, that you don't need. Okay, so here's the script, it's working. Please make sure that it's true before you continue on to the next part. All right, we are in the final, final stretch. Now let's say that you wanted to share this game with your friends. Um, First off, you want to save your game. So, and by the way, I recommend that you periodically save, like, 
often stop and save. I should have told you that like three times already. So file, we can do save to file as, and what this does is it puts it on your computer, right? It saves the file to your computer. And this is nice, but what I recommend, what I do, is I save to Roblox. And what this does is it takes your project and it puts it on Roblox's like cloud. So if you go to your friend's house and you log into your Roblox account, you can download your projects or work on them or whatever, right? It's, it's useful to have it in the cloud. So first, save to Roblox as. Now you're not gonna have as many games here probably. So you wanna hit the create new Yeah, you guys can see this. Okay, give your program a name. Um, test world is mine. Um, you can select what devices you would like people to log in with or be able to. Um, I generally only have computer. Hit create. It's gonna do some spinning. It's gonna take some, uh, you know, a little bit of time. And now that you've saved it to Roblox, you can publish to Roblox. There is a difference. When you save the game, that's only for you. When you publish the game, it's public. Um, any one of your friends or anyone can search up your program and they can play your game. So let's publish it, right? You wanna share this with your friends. So publish as, and here we have, uh, this is the same place that I just made. So I will overwrite this by clicking on that. Now imagine I did that, I'm not gonna overwrite it, uh, but yeah. And that is that. Um, um, just to recap what we have learned today, we learned a little bit about scripting, right? And how we can add scripts to our parts to have actions and modify them, do all kinds of things. We learned about the Explorer and the properties window, which allows us to modify the properties. We learned how to generate a world and how to fine tune it to our liking using these awesome, powerful tools. And, and yeah, so if you are interested in learning more Roblox stuff, uh, please take a look at codeforfun.com. We have a plethora of classes for you to take, um, and we are very excited that you guys are interested in doing so. So I hope to see you in my future classes. Uh, take care.